Hello, welcome. We'll just wait two or three minutes as our people load into the Zoom. Good afternoon and welcome everybody to the Stony Brook University College of Arts and Sciences preview session. I am Amanda Mills, Assistant Director of Admissions for Stony Brook. I have a few notes before we begin. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask our speaker any questions and we will answer them at the end of today's presentation. Second, please note that this session is being recorded and will be available on the admissions YouTube page soon. And lastly, there are a variety of topics that will be covered uh, during the next few days, both tomorrow, Tuesday, and Thursday coming up, and we encourage you to join us for all that interests you. And now please join me in welcoming our presenter, Sophie Leroy. Associate Professor of Cultural Studies and Comparative Literature and the Director for the Institute for Globalization Studies at Stony Brook. Welcome. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone to this talk on Disney and the representation of the others. So my name is Sophie Reynaud Leroy and I study Disney from a fairy tale and cultural studies perspective. I've been teaching at Stony Brook um, for over 20 years now. I started in 2001, and I feel at home with our great community of Stony Brook students. I recently elaborated a film course entitled The Problem with Disney, examining the intersection between race, gender, and class, where I also touch on disability to a small extent. The fact is that Disney has long been called racist, sexist, perhaps classist too, and definitely not best at inclusion. His representations of the others are problematic to say the least. Hence the title of my course, The Problem with Disney, a course that fills to capacity. So why such popularity or curiosity for the topic? Because students come there eager to hear what might be the problem with the films they loved watching growing up and still love to this day for most of them. Though they are capable of guessing occasional problems of representations, racism and sexism in particular. Racism in the old represent, um, racism in the old classic like Dumbo and the Aristocats. Sure, Pocahontas, it's a given. Um, once they find out what the real story was and how tragic it ended for our favorite Native American princess. Reviews are mixed for the princess and the frogs. Some love the fact that a black princess was represented at all. Some resented how poorly she was so. Now, from a less pragmatic and impressionistic perspective, from an academic one that is, I'll borrow the words of the critic Scott Schaefer in Disney and the Imagineering of, Store of Histories, who describes thus Disney's methodology and ideology. I quote, the Walt Disney Company co-opts local histories without their corresponding local social and political geographies, reconstitutes them as the company's own and sell them to Disney's customers as markers of American political, cultural, and imperial attitudes, end of quote. In plain, Disney is accused of whitewashing stories and characters from the other cultures it keeps drawing from. One is to wonder why they borrow them in the first place, especially the difficult ones, as in non-politically correct, such as Pocahontas, but that's for another paper. So I'll be focusing um, first on Disney's odd relationship with BIPOC or um, you know, people of color. An outsider to the American culture from the University of Manuba in Tunisia, Rim Latayev, wrote a whole dissertation about the stereotypes in Disney's classics. She called it a reflection and shaping of American culture from 24, um, that was in 2014, 2015. And she denounced two basic ethnic and racial stereotypes in Disney's classics the white as referent, and the minorities as the others with the capital O, in a hierarchy privileging the whites. 
Le Taillef refers to the melting pot ideology that was in use from 1780 till 1970, calling for the assimilation of immigrants into the white culture, with the white being made visible and the non-white marginalized. And she argues, rightfully so, that these two tenets were readily embraced by Walt Disney. In his classic, we know that the non-white are totally excluded. He targeted a WASP audience. Movies like Cinderella, Snow White, and Sleeping Beauty contain a cast that is almost entirely white. However, in the classics produced after the 1960s, Disney has adopted some colored protagonists in a strife to keep up with multiculturalism. And this is the corpus I'm going to look at briefly, skipping the Jungle Book from 1967, set in colonial India, because the problems there are pretty obvious. My case studies are from the Renaissance period, from the 90s up to now, starting with Aladdin in 1992. Aladdin uh, features the first Middle Eastern Arab princess, Jasmine, presumably Muslim, in a non-identified Middle Eastern city of Agrabah to read Baghdad. But we are during the first Gulf War, hence the necessary blurring. Only it offers a negative image of Arabs and Muslims. Jack Shaheen, in a remarkable study entitled Real, as in R-E-E-L, Bad Arabs, How Hollywood Vilifies a People, analyzed more than 900 films where Arab characters are featured, and according to him, only 5% of them depict those characters as normal human beings, while the other 95% are um, stereotypical rapists, kidnappers, robbers, bigots against Jews and Christians, and power and money hungry, very much like the stereotypical Jew in Nazi propaganda, even in the way they're physically depicted hook-nosed and all. I believe Disney's animated Aladdin is not even mentioned in that study, but I assigned that article to my students when we studied Aladdin, and I asked them if those stereotypes about the Arabs or Muslims could apply to it, and they all responded affirmatively. The film paradoxically juxtaposes Orientalism in the Edward Said definition, offering an amalgam of oriental tropes, in other words, the exotic other, appealing to the Euro-American with anti-Islamic and anti-Arab arguments, such as the criticism of Sharia law, repeatedly seen as barbaric, to civil law, Eurocentric, seen as a positive social reform. Aladdin updates the colonial discourse of the Orient to reflect more accurately American interest in the Middle East, that is the abundance of natural resources that drew the French and English settlers. Aladdin's missionary project replaces Islamic law, social codes and local aristocracy with American individualism, romance and the aristocracy of wealth. Our young hairy couple, Aladdin Jasmine, of the only Arabs, Muslims of the film to speak with an American accent, to have more Caucasian features, etc. While Aladdin's character is the only clean shaven male in the movie and his skin tone is light, every other male in the background or foreground of Aladdin has facial hair, traditionally associated with power and sexuality and have dark complexion. Jafar, the leading antagonist is described early in the film as, quote, a dark man with a dark purpose, end of quote. Jafar's accent is recognizably Anglo-Arab. He's tall with an exaggerated camel-like uh, camel nose. He's exquisitely evil. Jafar's great passion is raw power. The Sultan, on the other hand, is race neutral. He's a benign buffoon with a vaguely British accent fair-skinned. He's short, round, and virtually covered with fluffy hair, all white. The rest of the males in the cast of, um, of thousands of nameless caricatures, disingenuous salesmen, murderous palace guards, and a weird array of self-mortifying ascetics, thieves, and addicts. Aladdin's basic mission as a white savior is to rescue Jasmine from a loveless union with the vicious Arab. Muslim women 
are also shockingly represented wearing both hijabs or rather, quote, handkerchief sized face veils, end of quote, and belly tops with bulging breasts. Hijab as a social code becomes nonsensical in Aladdin. In this presentation of hijab, the veil is presented as an erotic prop for American fantasy that rather than a recognizable system of social order. Veiling in Aladdin is reduced to coquetry. It signals beauty and promises to reveal, not to cover. The moral of the film is simple. Only identification with the Euro-Amer the Euro American world can save good Arabs. That is, Arabs with lots of money, who are real political and military threats, who are no real political and military threat from bad Arabs. So bad Arabs want political power and are willing to use force to get it. In brief, it's a story of women's liberation and American victory over the Arabs. Disney freedom liberates Jasmine out of Islam and into American coupling systems. The film got bitter criticism by the Arab community. Let's look at The Lion King from 1994. It's an attempt by Disney to represent race in a healthy way. Uh, and The Lion King seemed at first to finally doing it, yet problems appeared when the hyenas came to the scene. Portrayed by three black actors, the hyenas are represented as being slobbery, mangy, stupid poachers and at the bottom of the food chains. Also, as found um, uh, in some other critics, the film made them look like hooligans by bullying and frightening Simba and others, with references to Black Hispanic cultures and ghetto. Um, and they're the only African indications in the film uh, since the only language that can be heard in the rest of the film is English. Rafiki, the baboon, seems like Eshu, an African deity who also protects the travelers and is responsible for the fortune or misfortune of creatures. However, even though he's respected in the film, he acts foolish and half crazed, characteristic that used to define African Americans. Also, the part in the film when Zazu tells Simba that one day Nala will be his wife and Sinda replies, quote, when I'm king, that'll be the first law to go, end of quote, shows some kind of disrespect for the um, African culture and customs of arranged marriages. And the same happened um, around the critique of um, arranged marriages in Mulan and in Pocahontas. A critic relates the film to the contemporary discourse of urban decline on the intersection of race and space, um, expressing the European tendency to conceptualize European culture by contrast to Africa's presumed culturelessness. The film offers a Eurocentric picture of Africa, with an Africa as a naturally existing and organically integrated circle of life. Oh, that was, um, that's a scene, three scenes of, uh, you know, a critique of the arranged marriages that I was talking about. And now back to the circle of life, a place of perfect harmony in which each and every species of life performs a function useful to others. Mufasa thus explains to his son Simba that the antelope who feeds the lion is then recycled when the lion dies and nourishes the soil that produces the grass that the antelope eats. But um, that critic argues that this image reduces Africa to the endless reproduction of a natural and prehistoric course of life. It also recalls travel literatures where Native Americans, for instance, were paradoxically described for their want of civilization on one part, yet admired for their paradisiac harmony on the others, a utopia that never existed like at the beginning of Pocahontas. The film supposedly set in Africa can be read as an allegory of American political life that denies that inner city Black and Latinos have a rightful place in the American polity. They're relegated to the periphery 
and the adventurous escapade of Simba and Nala shows what would happen if those minorities were to be enfranchised, empowered, as it actually happens under the rule of Scar. They would take over and bring the space to desolation. As a result, the Lion King has been said to be an argument for an American apartheid, one that rationalizes segregation and discrimination. Let's take a look now at Pocahontas from 1995. It presents the audience allegedly with a true story featuring Native American uh, heroine. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a slide for this because it's just a comment, uh, a very short comment about um, you know the contrast between the the, the will of of, of um, featuring a, 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 the story of a Native American heroine. Um, and the, the scandalous whitewashed feel-good version of the colonization of the Americas and the genocide of the natives. So now Mulan in 1998, um, it appears less subversive than Pocahontas, but it's still a case of cultural misappropriation and cultural deformation at the expense of Chinese culture. You see here, you know, making fun of, of, of uh, Tra Chinese traditional cultures and, and Chinese ancestors, it was not well received in China for that reason. So it's another case of Orientalism. The Princess and the Frog from 2009. The film finally features its first black princess and many people of color are cast, supposedly to celebrate a distinctly American multicultural Southern culture and landscape. It takes place in Jim Crow South, New Orleans, in the 1920s. And this is enough to warn you that we're walking on a tight rope here. Here are the main problems. Many noted that the first and only African-American princess, and like other princesses, is not a princess by birth, but rather becomes a princess through marriage to a prince. As well, Tiana aspires for a career in the, service, in the service industry, her dream is to own a restaurant, while other princesses remain happily ever after in the ivory tower of fairyland bliss, careerless. In brief, she's the only princess not receiving a princess treatment. Instead, she works willingly as a slave to make it and wouldn't make it if it were not for the intervention of the prince at the end who lends her money. So much for the American dream. Even though Disney expressly consulted with African Americans to avoid potential problems resulting from perceived racial insensitivity, reportedly Oprah Winfrey was one of the race sensitivity consultants while also voicing Eudora, Tiana's mother, in the movie, these pre- and post-release internet and alarmist media headlines shouted loudly and clearly, I, I quote, Disney's Princess and the Frog can't escape the ghetto from November 2009. Another one from May 2009, the black princess who isn't black enough. And finally, and one from June 2009, long lack of black princesses over, but not a fairy tale ending. Another major point of contention for many African American about this Disney first is the critical and social suspicion arising from the fact that Tiana's romantic interest is not African-American. Such critics are not so concerned that Tiana dates and eventually marries interracially, but rather why Disney does not allow its first African-American princess to romance and wed an African-American male. No chance of a black prince, not yet ready. The specificity of this interracial union breeds critical suspicions about the New Orleans setting during the 1920s when Jim Crow realities would have certainly interrupted on some level the seemingly smooth flow of this very public interracial pairing. Perhaps having the interracial couple romping through most of the film as frogs than as humans allows Disney to skirt these interrace issues. That Tiana's African-American fathers die so early in the film that the older black males are either physically challenged, illiterate and old or engage in criminal voodoo activity 
also raised serious questions about Disney construction of African American maleness. So to conclude on Disney's representation of other cultures, in particular BIPOCs, I'll say that Disney cannot do right and won't be able to do so. It's a lose-lose situation, though efforts are made. Moana was overall a success in this department, though it did have some problems. Raya, like Moana, making Pacific Islanders a homogeneous group, um, Raya is another case of amalga amalgamation of cultures, with all the countries of South Asia represented as a monolith. I'll uh, go now to the representation of the LGBTQ plus community in Disney and the queer coding of villains. Most of the heroes, that was Moana, most of the heroes and heroines of the beloved Disney film franchise are hyper um, heterosexual. They fall in love, get married and live happily ever after. In other words, they promote happy heterosexism. On the other hand, the villains offer a different pattern of representation that is deeply problematic. The female villains tend to display masculine attributes. While the male ones are often effeminate, both sides are gender bending. I'll give you an example. The, stepsister, the stepsisters in Cinderella, and I don't have a, a picture here, have managed traits such as flat chests, square bodies, large feet, as you know. Uh, they're clumsy in their mannerism when dancing, they're disgraceful when singing, they're more aggressive when they physically assault Cinderella. Um, this behavior and look is in sharp contrast with the ultra feminine Cinderella and other Disney princesses. Lady Tremaine, lack of positive or acceptable femininity, um, as far as she's concerned, resides in her unmotherly cold and domineering behavior, as well as her deep voice and her sharp facial features. Ursula in The Little Mermaid is modeled after a famous drag queen divine. She's deep voiced and avid of power, presumably suffering from penis envy with her desire to steal Triton's masculine trident, symbol of his um, royal power. Scar in The Lion King, is effeminate in body and voice tone. He performs that way and makes several allusions throughout the films to his equivocal nature, such as, I'll practice my curtsy, which is a, a female thing to do. A man bows. Jafar in Aladdin is, um, we've, al we've already seen Jafar in previous pictures, but if you remember his costume had the long and ornate gown when all the other male characters wear pants. His posture is affected and he acts with theatricality and elegance. Governor Ratcliffe on the left in Pocahontas is dressed in pink and purple clothes ornamented with cute little bows. He carries a tiny lap dog um, and he's served by high-pitched voice Higgins, whose hobbies are to design topiaries and create gift baskets for the Indians. It comes in sharp contrast with the masculinized hero, John Smith, or his marriage rival, the serious Indian warrior, Kokum. When evil characters share those transgender qualities, those become stigmatized and opposed to a normative behavior, which is the heterosexual uh, behavior. Gender bending or transgenderism is then associated with cruelty, selfishness, greed, and brutality. That's what is problematic in the ideological message it sends to viewers, in particular young ones whose ideas about genders are not yet formed. So one could then ask, what makes Disney villains so gay and why? So uh, according to Matt Baum, who wrote uh, a blog in 2021 about the phenomenon, it's a complicated history that dates back to the late 20s and early 30s America, when conservatives launched a moral panic over what they perceived as the lack of decency in films. Interracial couples, characters expressing um, disrespect for priests, sexual perversion, etc., 
and demanded that movies clean up their filth. The result was the implementation of the Hays Code in 1934, which forbade a wide range of content, including homosexuality. As a result, movies could no longer show sympathetic characters who were explicitly queer, but they could show characters who conformed to queer stereotypes as long as those characters were villains. And that's the climate in which Disney created Snow White's Evil Queen. Um, their, first feature, first, uh, their first feature film villain. She hits uh, a lot of lesbian stereotypes of the time, according to the LGBTQ community. She's tall, she's single, she's deboiced, occupying a traditionally male position of power. She's obsessed with a character um, um, who embodies the ideal of feminine beauty. Then a few years later, uh, they did the same with Captain Hook, giving him queer male stereotypes, fussy, garbed in pink, cowardly and untrustworthy, obsessed with capturing a boy. Then came Maleficent, who bestows an unwanted prick upon a maiden, rendering her unmarriageable. These are comments from um, um, the LGBT uh, community who um, tend to uh, give Maleficent some lesbian uh, traits. Then Cruella, whose character was based on the queer actress Tallulah Bankhead. And of course, in the Disney Renaissance, the trinity of baritone Ursula, eyeliner uh, Jafar, and Limpod Scar. Queer coding has been baked into Disney villains from the very beginning and stuck around for decades. So one of the questions one may ask now with more recent Disney films is whether this tendency is fading. And the answer, I think, thankfully, is yes. The example is Luisa, perhaps in Encanto from 2021. Luisa has superhuman strength. She's allow, um, allowing her, her to lift large, heavy things such as buildings and bridges with ease. I'm reading from a, a Disney wiki that describes her character. And like other members of her family who struggle in some degree to contain and control their power, there is no indication that Luisa cannot control her strength, unlike Elsa, as we'll see um, later from Frozen. Luisa is also a very proficient singer and dancer. So I just wanted to show uh, um, that finally, um, we come to uh, a positive representation of, of a gender bending um, character in Disney. And that's very, very new. Let me talk last about the representation of the disabled in Disney films. Like with the representation of LGBTQ characters, Disney's own history of disability representation is fraught with problematic imagery and stereotypical um, depictions. Beginning with Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs Dopey in 1937, uh, who can be, he was a character who can be read as intellectually disabled. Disney has struggled to represent disability in a realistic and ethical light, due in part to the need to make the disabled character a cute object. Moving forward, Disney takes a different tactic in Dumbo 1941 by encoding disability into an animal character outright, this time a baby elephant. Dumbo can fly by flapping his inordinately large ears, thus earning him the love of both the audience and the other circus animals. We've seen uh, Peter Pan's Captain Hook from 1952, uh, who's also um, uh, portrayed as a disabled person and a villain, but a funny villain. Beauty and the Beast, 1991, once again attempts a social commentary, this time using a familiar fairy tale as its catalyst. There too, Disney relies on the cute factor focusing on Beast's human qualities in order to make him more of a victim rather than a monster. It is not until the release of The Hunchback of Notre Dame in 1996 
that Disney took their first pass at a realistic portrayal of disability, though with limited success. In the film, the title character of the famous 19th century French novel, Our Lady of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo, Quasimodo, a Latin nickname meaning half-formed, is oversimplified, remade into a quote, an awkward child with self-esteem problems, as the critic put it. The film did not receive good reviews in general because of its oversimplification and misrepresentation of both Hugo's novels and the real life issues of people with disability, that people with disability face. So let's talk about Frozen in 2013. It marks a turning point. For the first time, there's a positive representation of disability in Frozen. Um, as well as it is a, 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 a it is a milestone because it features the first disabled princess. It's not surprising that Disney had been reluctant to revisit disability, um, given the hunchback of Notre Dame's poor reception. But Frozen turned the experience of disability into a universal one this time, not one of exclusion, with beloved Princess Elsa. Disney's Frozen first began as a remake as, um, of uh, Hans Christian Andersen, um, The Snow Queen, as you can see on the left. Originally, Disney planned on following the original storyline of featuring the queen as a villain and antagonist in a love story between a boy and a girl. However, in the process, John Lasseter, the creative executive, had a change of heart when his own son, Sam was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes at age 10. Lasseter confessed in an interview that when creating the character of Elsa, he thought of Sam's anxiety about his ailment and how Elsa, just like him, was born with this impairment. And he thought it unfair to show her as a villain because of that. This led him to reconsider the entire concept for Frozen and can explain the character's transformation from villainous queen as in Anderson's version to a sympathetic teen, the Disney version. Elsa was born with the power to make ice and snow flow from her fingertips, and it is seen as a curse. However, when she becomes anxious or afraid, she's unable to control her magic. As we know, this leads to Elsa unintentionally plunging the country of Arendelle into an eternal winter when she and Anna fight at a coronation ceremony. The villagers attack her, believing her to be a monster, and she flees her kingdom in fear. And her sister Anna, representing the normative princess, then embarks on a journey to save both her sister and her home. If Elsa's disability may be encoded as a fantastic power, the way the condition is clear, uh, the way her condition is, is clearly presented uh, is as an impairment. After Anna's accident, Elsa's power is treated as suspect by the king and queen, and Elsa is put, in a, is put in a stigmatized position. This role is normally reserved for Disney villains. Elsa's condition, which is triggered by fear and anxiety, is representative not only physical, uh, but also mental and cognitive disability, as many viewers have noted and found relatable. The mishandling of Elsa's condition by her parents resonates, especially with those who live with anxiety and depression. They lock Elsa away in her room and forbid her from seeing her sister or anyone else in the kingdom. They present her with thick gloves to cover her hands and instruct her, conceal, don't feel. It is Elsa's own parents and not a discernible villain who put Elsa into this isolated position to be recognized as institutionalization. Even after the tragic death of their parents, Elsa continues to isolate herself, unable to break down the psychological barrier that her parents and the trolls have erected. This is in keeping with the theory um, um, excuse me, that uh, people with disabilities are oftentimes depicted as isolated from both their families and communities and also from other people with disabilities. As the story progresses though, and Elsa grows up, 
it becomes apparent that the society at large, rather than just her parents, is responsible for Elsa's poor treatment. At this point, in a Disney film, a character like Elsa would ordinarily transform into a villain, and then they transform into Avengers, like, um, um, like Maleficent, for instance, in, in Sleeping Beauty. However, in this film, Disney refuses the familiar stereotype of disability as monstrous or villainous and retains the audience's empathy for Elsa by following her journey up the mountain rather than remaining with the villagers down below. Her widely popular Let It Go begins with the declaration that Elsa has found herself in a kingdom of isolation and it looks like I'm the queen, quote, Elsa's songs indicate that it is her parents and society rather than herself who are to blame for her current situation. Don't let them in, don't let, me, don't let them see, be the good girl you always have to be. But at this point, Elsa wags her finger, admonish, admonishing herself as she remembers what she has been taught. By mid-song, she rejects this teaching and with her, and with it, her home and former identity singing, I don't care what they're going to say. Let the storm rage on. The cold never bothered me anyway. These lines are not only catchy, they also form an anthem of independence that resonates with both disabled and able-bodied audience members, all of whom can likely remember a time when they've had enough. It is at this point that Elsa transformed visually, donning a new wardrobe to match her new attitude. There is a sense of relief of relief in this moment as Elsa releases the tension that has been building around her character since the scene with the trolls. For audience members, the relief partially comes from both the realization that she is not so different from them after all. So to close this um, um, presentation, I would like to um, propose that we could use perhaps Elsa's illustrious anthem, Let It Go, as the magic formula, Disney used to open the door to a more liberal way of thinking disability, but then also queerness, etc. A message that being an other is simply being human and fully belonging to society. And um, perhaps these uh, princesses such as Rhea, or uh, Merida and, and, many, and many more or new ones or to be coming ones um, will be proof of that. And I would like to challenge the audience with um, some questions also. Do you have suggestion on how Disney could make it right by all? How far can Disney go in diversity and inclusion. Thank you for listening and I'll be glad to take some of your questions if you have any. Thank you so much, Sophie. We have a question for you from uh, earlier in the presentation. Um, do you think the criticism about arranged marriages is more directed toward the overall cultures or the institution of forced marriages that takes away a woman's control over their life and happens to be related to certain cultures? Wow, so this is, um, this is a tough question, a tough question, but um, it really depends on what your own um, um, stance is in, in regards to arranged marriages. But the idea is that Disney take a very um, white Anglo-Saxon or Western um, um, stance towards um, that tradition, which is no longer, you know, uh, applied in, in, in the US or in, in the Western world. And so just uh, without the possibility uh, that it could be offensive to cultures that still practice it, and also assuming that it's a necessary uh, that it's an it's evil in itself, and so that's that's where it becomes um, 
a little uh, touchy. It's that uh, it's it comes back as a motto in like I, I showed three films that there is this obsession with arranged marriages as something that the characters, the, the, the young female in, in those cases, absolutely don't want. The problem is in Pocahontas, for instance, um, I've read a lot of uh, critique critique from uh, uh, the Native American community. They didn't like the film. Um, I think it's a beautiful film, but it's very problematic for the reasons that um, we, we can understand. But they all say that they took exception to that. And it's not realistic in the sense that a woman raised um, in that context would not have acted like a capricious, uh, you know, American modern teenager. So I hope I'm, I make myself clear there. Same thing as Jasmine. Her behavior is 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 that of an American teenager. It's it's not conformed to what a young princess bred the way she had been uh, would naturally behave. She she might very well conform to. She might not like it, but she she would conform more easily than it is showed and assumed in, um, in Disney films. Thank you. And we have a question uh, that came in. Um, what is your opinion on new short films Disney is producing like Bao? I think I'm pronouncing that right. Wow, you're trapping me here because I haven't seen it. Um, as you may notice, uh, my references are very academic. And um, there's always a, a delay uh, by which, you know, um, a film is uh, critiqued in, in a very thorough manner. And so, um, you know, especially in the case of short film now with Disney Plus, we have such an abundance of production um, and so fast that it's going to take a few years for people to deeply analyze what's going on. So I, I can't talk about this one because I don't know, but what I can talk uh, about is, is, is clearly the, the trend towards, you know, uh, diversity and inclusion. And also um, wondering how far it goes. That was one, my last question, as a matter of fact, um, you know, there was an article recently on the New York Times in, in regards to um, including LGBTQ characters, you know, open, openly gay. That's why I was talking about queer coding before. As long as they were queer coded, we couldn't say they were gay. The studios would never admit that they were gay. But if we say gay now, is it going to alienate a big portion of the um, audience? Um, and so I'm curious to see how this is going to evolve, how they're going to negotiate that. And Disney is always behind um, the, the trends, you know, the sociological tr or ideological trends. So I hope I, I partially responded um, to, to that question. Yeah, I think Disney Plus is very progressive that way. Yes, thank you. Um, well, if there are no um, additional questions, I don't see any in the Q&A. Um, we can end for today. Thank you uh, so much for joining us this afternoon. Sophie, thank you for a thoughtful, informative, and thoroughly engaging presentation. We hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Please be well. Thank you so much, and thank goodbye. You. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Paula. And thank you, everybody. And I wish you the best. And I hope you come to Stony Brook. <laughs> Great. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.